those of you who don't know, my name is Jane Smith and I am Head of Library and Archives and um, I'm going to do a double act with James Hodgkin who is the Library Services Manager. Um, but what we're presenting actually is um, a joint effort. We're working with a number of colleagues both in the library and outside the library um, on this project. Um, and two of our colleagues um, who've also contributed to the um, presentation, if it works, great, um, Sarah Vincent and Michael Loran, so they're sitting there, so if there are any questions at the end they may be able to help too. So uh, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to share what we're going to do. Um, I think um, the library and the archives work has been um, referred to throughout the morning and the afternoon, which is, which is very good. But just to give a sense of what we will cover today, we're um, involved in a five-year strategy, two years into that five-year strategy, to improve and develop our library services, to look at our physical collections and how they're stored and how they're accessed, but critically to look at um, our digital offer, hence the Virtual Library Project. Some of the challenges we're facing at the moment is that I think this has been alluded to throughout this morning and this afternoon in that we're going through um, what my fellow information professionals would regard as another information explosion. And I think there is an expectation now that everything is available, it's freely available and um, it's easily accessible. Um, but there's also a lot of content out there that um, has not been digitized yet or is behind a paywall or um, behind copyright. So although on one level it's accessible through catalogues um, and through websites, it's not necessarily completely searchable. So some of the challenges that we're facing is that we have a range of resources at this institution that um, is historical and current and our users, um, our core users, are our science users, but also increasingly we have users who are coming to us from different disciplines, arts, humanities, social sciences, commercial backgrounds, and they want to access that full range of content. Um, how do I? Yeah. So the pie chart here gives an idea of some of the challenges that we're facing both at this institution but it also reflects what our colleagues in other institutions are facing. We are digitizing our collections and we're also buying or acquiring or providing access to through open source uh, resources um, digital content but the actual proportion of that is quite small and it's represented by 1% born digital. Of the content that we're currently subscribing to, only about a third of it is actually available electronically in any kind of digital format. So that leaves you to conclude that two thirds of it is still produced in paper based format and that's the only way that it can be accessed at the moment. But it also gives a sense of the challenge that both we're facing and our sister organizations are facing in terms of the um, existing physical content that we have, the physical maps, the physical manuscripts, the physical books and journals, and other forms of paper-based or physical material, in that um, over 60% of it is, um, has been published since 1920, so is covered by copyright. So there are restrictions about how we can provide access to that, whether we digitize it or not. The rest of it, some of it is unique material. So although other institutions are digitizing other versions of um, Darwin's on Origin of Species, copies of Nature, um, we have, what, uh, two thirds of um, the, uh, older material is unique to this institution. The material that we've collected has been collected because of its primarily scientific content and much of it also complements um, what is held by the other specimen departments and is often used side by side um, with those specimens, often to um, support research but also to answer inquiries. That material also complements what is held in other institutions and I'll come on to this in a little while but that's one of the reasons why we are working on our virtual library to enable access to this full range of material, whatever format it's in, so that people know what is available 
Um, people now are relying on the Google search, but Google does not pick up on, on everything. It doesn't pick up on material that is not available digitally. It will only pick up on the metadata. And what we're trying to do also through our digitization programs is not just sort of turn ourselves inside out as a library and archives and expose that full range of material. Um, it's also about connecting it to the collections that are held by other institutions. So what are we trying to do through the Virtual Library Project? Well, um, what we're particularly focusing on is that we're using systems, both um, manual and um, technical systems, that are now very out of date, old-fashioned. We're relying on technology that is approximately 20 years old. We are relying on um, our professional networks um, by um, supporting those networks, contributing to those, and also sort of benefiting from what they're coming up with in terms of international standards for sharing data. We contribute a lot of our catalogs data to um, search resources that enable um, a researcher wherever they are in the world to get a sense of what's held in, in every library, whether uh, that content is physically available or digitally available. And we need to continue doing that. Um, but the challenge we have at the moment with the, the setup that we have is that because it's so old-fashioned, it was designed at a time when there wasn't this digital arena, and we now need to um, have systems and practices available that enable us to both deliver content and exploit content that is available electronically. So I'm now going to hand over to, to James, who's going to go into a little bit more detail about exactly what we're trying to achieve through that virtual library project. Okay, so probably a good place to start um, is where we are now, um, and that is multiple interfaces. Each has to be searched separately. Um, the library, in, uh, library collections and processes currently exist in unconnected silos, and so do our workflows. Um, we've obviously tried to develop the best services we can around those, um, but there's serious limitations with our systems when they don't link together. Um, and I'm sure you've probably had experience of some of the cumbersome and largely manual pro procedures we have, for instance, for requesting off-site material from our store, or also the difficulty you may have found in finding things from other institutions. Um, and even more fundamentally than that, the thing that you're looking for may be available in full text, either through one of our subscribe to formats or via open access, but the search just doesn't make you aware of that at all. Um, a number of workshops we've had and surveys that we've had to do with this project um, with our core NHM users have highlighted these problems, um, but they've also fed directly into the requirements for this project. Um, and we are aware that some of our users are effectively abandoning the library and they're moving towards standard search systems, more general search tools. And it's understandable why a lot of you turn to Google Scholar as a go-to search tool. Um, we undoubtedly want to capture some of that simplicity, but we also think that what we can add to that is our unique collections and also the uniquely focused collections that we have. So maybe we're not going to replace the Google Scholar, but we could become um, complementary to it and a more viable alternative to it as well. Um, um, maybe if we just have a look at the... Uh, the daisy, that's where we want to get to, a single search box, obviously. Um, and maybe what we should have a look at there also are the routes, because they're the bits that you shouldn't really be interested in. They're the processes, the systems, the, um, the procedures, the collections, the locations that us librarians have to deal with. But you shouldn't really have to care about that. All you want, you want to get it, and you want to get it as quickly as possible. And we understand that. Um, the aim of the Virtual Library Project is to, is to make these library collections discoverable within a single interface. So we're going to try and pull all these systems together into one discovery search. And um, we want to increase the visibility of our digitized resources. We want to reveal the, the connections between our collections. And we also want to provide a system that can manage the digital space, because that 1% sliver of the pie you saw earlier on is going to grow, and it's going to grow rapidly. And also, as digitization kicks in and accelerates, we need to be able to manage those collections. So we're currently out to tender um, for a discovery system and a library management system. Um, we've shortlisted six. Um, they also include open source systems as well. Um, 
Uh, I've described a bit about discovery system, but the library management system, that's really the back end, if you like. So that's going to kind of hopefully remove some of those roots of the daisy that you're not going to be interested in. But what that will allow us to do is free up our time to provide more services and provide some more research support for you. Um, and it's also going to allow things like better indexing of our existing database, which is going to give us that sort of fuzzy searching that some of you have asked us for, more like a Google experience we, that we know you want. Um, the tender review happens in September, um, and colleagues from outside, you will be invited along as well. Have you got any more time? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, just to skip through a couple of things then. Um, a couple of things that we wanted to mention is that two examples of the um, resources that we want to connect and currently cannot do so effectively. One is the um, museum's um, repository. Now this is an article repository. It's kind of live at the moment, it needs a bit more work, but this is one way that we think we can expose um, the research outputs here, um, that um, so the pre-publications or the actual publications that have been produced by, by all of you, and make those available both internally but critically externally. And it's also something that links to open source publication resources like Biomed Central. The other thing that I quickly wanted to mention as well um, was our involvement in the Biodiversity Heritage Library. And this is another key resource that through that discovery platform we're hoping to implement, we will be able to reconnect the content that we're pushing out through that um, uh, by the, by the, I can't say it, BHL. Um, and just a bit of a plug here. Um, already, we've talked about the digital NHM. Well, already the library has approximately um, 3 million images out there. Um, uh, BHL in total has pre produced about 41 million digitized pages. But that's, and, and our, our contribution at the moment is about 3 million of those. Um, it's, it's a tiny slice of the, the global pie. Um, it's about 7% of the biodiversity literature that we think um, is available to be digitized. Um, but it is linked to EOL pages, it's linked to GBIF, we've got connections with um, Europeana. So it's one way that we have of pushing our content out to be used widely by a wider community. It is used by science users, and we've got examples um, in house who are using this as a primary resource. Um, but also, we've done some uh, Google Analytics on the website there, and um, just of the NHM content in there, that 3 million pages, we get approximately, or an average, of about 70. 700,000, no that's not right, 70,000 hits and downloads per month just on that 3 million pages, which is not quite 6,000 um, titles. So you can, it, it's a good illustration I think of by turning ourselves inside out how much more we can expose our content. And again, just very quickly to move on, this is an example of uh, one of the scientists who's based at Woods Hole, and some of you may know him, who is actually working on the content in, in BHL. So we're not just pushing out images and hoping that somebody does something with it. People are actually working on that, and what he's doing is um, um, basically extracting the taxonomic terms and, and getting a sense of how those taxonomic terms have changed over time. So basically, what are the most popular descriptions in this instance of the guinea pig or it might be of um, the bluefish. So what I'm trying to say is that we're pushing out content and it, has, it, it is actively being curated by um, the BHL, if you like, worker bee, so that's NHM staff and other colleagues in the um, multiple institutions that are involved in what is in effect a, um, a global faculty library for biodiversity. So uh, moving on, uh, to summarise what we're trying to achieve in terms of our virtual library. Um, so we are aware of the importance of having open and interoperable systems to enable connections to be made between our collections and data and collections both inside the NHM and outside as well. So our chosen systems will have open APIs and the web services which will allow us to reuse our metadata um, and make it available to other systems as well. Um, and nothing says net that metadata better than that. I guess. Um, so um, we understand the importance of having, um, we, we, I mean, of course, the availability and quality of the metadata is vital for this all to work well. Um, the library and archives are already meeting minimum international standards um, and 
we're already exposing our collections more widely, but obviously we can do that better. Um, so the exciting bit is we go live um, in the summer of next year with all this. Um, and if you want to know any more, you can contact me. Uh, you can have a look at our project wiki if you're really interested. Um, find out a bit more about um, the supplies that we're currently looking into and also the project documentation. Um, there's also links to our website, BHA. Okay, thank you very much.